chorus every time. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is must when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle, in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and the race on earth is run, He will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Please take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading to Acts chapter 13, please. Acts chapter 13 for the scripture reading today. We're going to read three verses this morning, verses 1, 2, and 3 of Acts chapter 13. And we'll read verse 1 together, and then I'll read verse 2, and then we'll end together reading verse number 3 of Acts chapter 13. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Acts 13. Ready? Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture now this morning. Lord, thank you already for the wonderful music today, the wonderful spirit that's here in this place, the good testimonies we've heard the opportunity for us to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. And Lord, it's, uh, it's just already been good to be in church this morning. And Lord, we're asking you now that you would bless the special as it's sung. And Lord, prepare our hearts to receive the preaching, the teaching from your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. that up in heaven God is sitting on his throne anticipating another sinner will soon become his own years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over as he receives the gift of life go sound the horn Strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire, no more in darkness, he's received my son, all heaven rejoices, that's the value of one. The Holy Spirit has 
that's been working to soften up a heart. All he needs is a willing servant to simply do his part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy that's there that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son, all heaven rejoices, that's the value of one. Start construction on the mansion. He doesn't know oh, yet yeah. what mm -hmm. is waiting when the Savior will heal me. Heal me. Here we go. Go sound the horn. Strike up the choir. A sinner receives. Save from the fire. No more in darkness. He's received my soul. Father, we thank you for this morning now. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to open up your word together. Thank you, Lord, for the good music today and, Lord, even the song that we just heard, that the value of one. Lord, that one soul is valuable to, to you and it ought to be valuable to us. And, Lord, I'm asking for your help this morning as we bring the message today. That Father, you would help each individual listening this morning to listen very carefully and that each of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say to each of our hearts this morning. But we don't just want to give lip service to say I love missions. We want our heart to be one with your heart in this matter. And so Lord I pray that you'd have your will and your way in each heart and life this morning. Help me as I bring the message and help the people as they listen. Help me to say the things that I need to say and to leave unsaid things I don't need to say. And the Spirit of God say what only you can say to each and every heart. And I'll thank you for it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts, if you want to get a broad outline of the book of Acts, you would... God had, Jesus had given the disciples some uh, orders. Uh, he said, you're going to receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you and you're going to be witnesses unto me. And He said, you're going to witness in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And as you open up the book of Acts and you go through the first seven chapters, they fill the city of Jerusalem with their doctrine. Uh, they, they, uh, the church there in Jerusalem had phenomenal growth. Uh, depending on different historians you read, it, can, it was anywhere from 10,000 to some claim as many as 50,000 uh, that that church grew to be in just uh, a short amount of time. We know that because of persecution, they finally scattered in, starting in chapter 8. In chapter 8 through 12, the church goes to Judea and Samaria. They fulfilled the second a part of God's commission to them. And then once you had Acts 13 that we read this morning, they're going out into all the world to preach the gospel. Paul and Barnabas setting out on their first missionary journey. The book of Acts is our handbook uh, for the church and it's our example. We have a mandate from God to get the gospel out to the world. Uh, is this on? We have a mandate from God to get the gospel out to the world. God wants us to be involved in missions. That's not, not a, it's not optional. It's not something that is, is a suggestion. It is a command from God that we be involved in missions. We can pray, we can give, and we can go. 
And the truth is, you can do all three. Amen. So it's time for the church to be involved, and I think that the church ought to be involved in the community, and that's important, and we ought to be a lighthouse in our community, and, and we endeavor to do that. We ought to impact our area for Christ and impact our state for Christ, but the truth is, the Lord says we ought to impact our world for Jesus Christ. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now Acts 13, I want you to look there again with me. And it's giving us on how to get the job done. And I'm going to look at what they did in the church at Antioch who sends out the first missionaries. And the first missionaries, the Bible, it lists the men who are serving there, uh, prophets and teachers in the church. And the verse 2 says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, they've been called to do a work. And I want to look at, first of all, what is, what is the mission? When you say, well, we believe in missions. Well, I think you have to define just what is the mission. A mission is this, by definition, a sending or a being sent, being sent by delegated authority with certain powers for transacting business. Commission has sent on a foreign mission. That's why when Jesus Christ in five different occasions told His disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, He said in five different ways and five different occasions, He was commissioning them. That's why we call it the Great Commission. He's commissioning them. In Matthew, before He gave that command, He said, All power is given unto Me in heaven and earth. I have the authority and I'm sending you out with My authority to go preach the gospel to every creature. In John 20, in verse 21, He said, As the Father has sent Me, even so send I you. And so we're sent just as Jesus was sent, just as He came to earth and lived a sinless life, lived a perfect life, and ministered to others and helped others to receive Him as their Savior and to receive the gift of eternal life as He was taken and crucified on a cross and then three days risen from the dead and brought back to life by God Himself, He appears for 40 days uh, after His resurrection before the disciples see Him rise up into the clouds and they see Him taken back into heaven. And before He goes, before they see Him rise, before they see Him ascend back to heaven, He gives them the mission of going and being witnesses into all the world. And the listen... The mission is still the same. The mission has not changed. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. We are to get the Word of God to everyone. And the truth is, we've fallen behind on the mission. We've not kept up with the mission. You know, I was reminded as I was reading this this week and preparing for this message, D.L. Moody uh, was of course a great soul winner and uh, wanted to give the gospel to as many people as he could and he, he always made it his practice that he would witness to somebody every single day. And one man was talking to his friend and said, you know, Moody cornered me the other night on the street and, and tried to give me the gospel and tell me about Jesus. And the man said, well, why didn't you tell Moody to mind his own business? And the man said, it seemed like it was his business. And that's the way it ought to be. It ought to seem like when we tell folks about Jesus and we give them the Gospel, that we do it with the authority that Jesus Christ made it our business. I tell people often, when you go to witness to them, they'll say, well, that's a private matter. If you ask them if they know if they died, they go to heaven. Or if you ask them if they know Christ as their Savior, however you want to word it, and they'll say, that's a private matter. And and I try to be kind about it, and uh, because I'm a very kind person. And I try to be very kind and say, uh, listen, I, I appreciate that, but it's really not a private matter. It's a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. It's not private because Jesus told me to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means it's not a private matter. It's a personal matter. And you must personally do something with Jesus Christ. And so when He tells us to go and to preach the gospel to every creature or to preach it to all the world, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't, don't, don't think that it's, 
It's just a every nation. You know, there's the, the word for nation or for uh, uh, teach all nations or people or is a people groups. And we've learned this from our Wednesday night prayer guide that, that it's not just the, you can watch the Olympics and see the parade of the nations come in and count how many nations there are. But you have to understand there's a lot. The word is ethnos. It's, it's ethnic groups within that country. For instance, in the, in the country of Ethiopia, there's over a hundred different ethnic groups in that country. Uh, God isn't just saying, just teach the nation. He's saying you reach every single ethnic group in that nation. You reached every single people group that you can in that country. And we want to take the gospel to every creature. All people groups, all cultures, all people, every individual need to hear about Jesus Christ. They need to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. What a shame for the first time someone would hear about Jesus would be when they're in the flames of hell. How tragic that would be. We have to give the gospel to every creature. So... I'm glad God loves us all. He wants all ethnicities, all groups of people to be blessed by His presence and saved by Jesus Christ. Now, Antioch was a much smaller church than the church in Jerusalem had been. But God used the church at Antioch because it had a heart for others. It had a heart for the Gospel. And, and God's always chosen that. You know, he started at Jerusalem and he used them until they didn't, they didn't obey the command, quite frankly. They, they weren't moving out of Jerusalem. They, they thought things are pretty good right here. And, and I don't know that we want to go this Judea and Samaria route. And so God raised up some persecution. Stephen got stoned. Saul rose up and began to persecute the church. And you read about it, it's really interesting how in Acts 1.8 it's the command to go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth and it doesn't happen till Acts 8 and verse 1. And, and those of you with dyslexia may get that. But they, uh, that now they turn around and guess what? Now they start all scattering abroad preaching the gospel. Now they go into Samaria and they begin to preach. God had to send that persecution to get them moving that way. Then God, and you find out in Acts chapter 11, switches the center of operations from Jerusalem to Antioch. And they were called Christians first in Antioch. And, and the believers, when, when Barnabas went down and saw the disciples at Antioch and encouraged them in the things of God, he left to find Saul. And when he found Saul, he didn't go back to Jerusalem. He brought Saul back to Antioch. He said, you're going to be right here. And they stayed there for a year teaching them the Word of God. And that's why they were called Christians first in Antioch. And then you find out that prophets and teachers came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then you find the first missionaries that are coming out of the church come out of the church at Antioch. And we see God shifting now His center of operations to a place called Antioch. But in time, Antioch lost its burden as well. And they lost sight of the mission. And, the, and God centered His operation to a church called Ephesus. You read about that church in Revelation chapter 3. And they were a great church. Uh, uh, according to history, the Apostle John was the pastor of that church. And, and they did a great job. But we know in Revelation chapter 3, the Bible says, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. And He commands them to repent and do the first works. Get back on mission. Get back to what I've called you to do. From down through the, through the years of time, God brought Germany to a great revival and had that hand on the, on the nation of Germany and many missionaries went forth. But skepticism came in and rationalism, something that's called higher criticism, came to Germany and soul winning and missionary work became a thing of the past and God moved on. And then He went to England. And for many years, England was the place that God was using. The center of activity, revivals, the launching pad for world, world missions. William Carey came from England that he went to India as the first missionary, foreign missionary. Hudson Taylor 
from England who went to China. And, and, and England was a hotbed of spiritual activity and, and people being sent forth to the mission field. But they lost sight of the mission. But God was raising up a country across the ocean called the United States of America. And now for many years, the United States of America has been the place that has sent out tens of thousands of missionaries preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you can't, you can't help but wonder as America falls away from God and America gets further and further away from the mission whether God's going to raise someone else up and God's going to move on to somewhere else. It's not that we, we it's the fire of evangelism, the fires for missions go out in our churches. And we're, we're more concerned about what we have instead of getting the gospel out to the world. Then, then God will move on to someone else. You know the United States is now 18th per capita at sending out missionaries? 18th in the world per capita. Did you know that of the giving to churches, two cents of every dollar goes to missions? In the, in the churches and charitable giving to churches in America, out of every dollar that's given, two cents goes to foreign missions. Compare that to 40 cents of every dollar in 1940. Have we lost our mission? Have we lost sight of the mission of getting the gospel to the world? Oh, I know. We put on nice clothes. We leave our nice homes. We drive our nice cars. We come to a nice building. We have padded chairs to sit in. We hear a nice sermon. We'll go out to a nice restaurant and have a nice meal and maybe go home and take the Baptist Sunday afternoon nap. And the truth is, we have no thought to the fact that millions, in fact, billions, are still without hope in this world have never heard of Jesus Christ. They didn't have a good day today. They didn't have a nice day today. They had a hopeless day again today. And we didn't give it a thought. God's not obligated to keep using America. God's not obligated to keep using Bible Baptist Church unless we stay true to the Scriptures, unless we remain focused on the mission that God has given to us to go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. I pray God will allow us to stay on mission. Someone said there's three kinds of people in the world, those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. I hope you're part of those who are going to make things happen. Same thing said about churches. There's churches that know God will work. They know what God's doing. And by the way, this listen, just as God changed countries to send out missionaries and to use them, God does that with churches. I could, I could take you to churches that 30 and 40 years ago were, were what we would say on fire for God. Exciting and souls being saved, and missionaries being sent out, that you would walk in the auditorium today and it's, it's deader than last week's meatloaf. I mean, it, there's nothing happening. You can ice skate down the aisle. It just, it just is, is, is dead as can be. God has moved on somewhere. They lost sight of the mission. The mission of getting the gospel to every creature. They've degenerated to a social club. We all want to know, what is the church going to do for me? What kind of programs do you have for me? What kind of things are you going to do for... And, and it's, like a, it's, like a, you're, it's like you're applying for a gym membership. What can you do for me? And, and this guy down here, here, he's offering me this and this and this. What do you offer me? And, and we've lost sight of the mission. I want to stay on mission. I don't, I don't want to be a 21st century church. I want to be a 1st century church. Stay on the mission. But then I want you to quickly notice, too, the message. The message. 
the message has always been and always will be the gospel. Mark 16 and verse 15. The, in fact, look at that verse with me, will you please? Mark 16 and verse 15. Jesus gave His command at the end of Matthew, the end of Mark, the end of Luke, the end of John, and the first chapter of Acts. In Mark 16 and verse 15, Jesus said this, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach... What's the next two words, church? What are we preaching? The Gospel. To who? Every creature. We're preaching the Gospel. What's the Gospel? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Will, will you please? 1 Corinthians 15. This is the Gospel. And, and let me remind you, this is the whole Gospel. This is the full Gospel. And nothing but the Gospel. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 3. The Apostle Paul writes, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the Gospel. Notice verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So I delivered unto you, and there's the Gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Someone says, do you go to a full Gospel church? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. It's full Gospel. I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the Gospel. And listen, if people don't hear the Gospel, if they don't know Jesus Christ died for their sins, that He made the payment for them, and they by faith can receive Him as their Savior, they will die and go to hell. What, what does a person have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Just live. Don't do anything. And listen, as tragic as that is, how tragic is it for us when we could tell them? When we have the message, we have the Gospel, and we don't share it with them. We don't tell them about Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for missionaries who help with food and clothing and education. I'm thankful for missionaries who help with cleanliness and hygiene. I'm thankful for those who care for orphans or the sick or the infirmed, but my friend, it's all in vain if they die and go to hell. It's, it's all for naught. I want to, we must give them the Gospel. Oh, I'm for, I'm for taking a medical team and giving them medical help or doing dental work. But listen, while you're getting their teeth fixed, get their soul fixed. While you're giving them some food to eat, tell them about Jesus. Give them the Gospel. Oh, I, I hear missions trips where people go and they say, well, what would you do? Well, we painted this building or we, we, we built this or we, we did this. And you say, well, did anybody get saved? Did anybody get, get the Gospel to anybody? Well, no, they didn't do that. Hey, there are folks out there that are good-hearted and kind-hearted and they can do those kind of things. But we have the message. We have the Gospel. What changes people's lives is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. You sang this morning, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Hey, you don't say, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since I went to church. I'm sure that's a good thing. And I'm not telling you don't go to church. Believe me. I want you here. It beats preaching empty seats. But listen, it's not church that changes your life. It's Jesus Christ that changes your life. And, and He makes the difference. So we must, we must preach Christ. It's okay to care for the needs of the body, but the message is for the salvation of the soul. And whether it's a woman at the well in Samaria whether it's a jailer in Philippi, whether it's a eunuch in the desert, whether it's a Muslim in the Middle East or a Buddhist in the Far East, the message is the same. Preach Christ. Preach Christ. He's the one who saves. He's the one who transforms lives. He's the one who will change you. 
We don't go to preach a church. We don't go to preach a religion. We're going to preach Jesus Christ. That's the message. So we have the mission, we have the message. Now, let me tell you number three about the messenger. If you recall Mark 16, 15, Jesus said unto them, Go, what's the next word after go? Ye. Go, you. No, 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 no. Don't, don't look at me and say, go you. Put a mirror up in front of your face and say, go you. Okay? God's talking about me. In Acts 13, they had the men serving in the church there. And the Holy Ghost said, you separate me, Paul and, or Saul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, for the work went to I have called them. The messengers with the message on the mission is you and me. I wish, I almost did this. I probably should have. I was going to go out and see at the dollar store if I could buy everybody a little mirror. And I was going to have you hold one this morning. I want you, because I want you to look at that mirror and say, I am a missionary. Will you say that with me? I am a missionary. Say it again. I am a missionary. Yes, you are. We all are. The concern for world evangelism and getting the gospel out is not something that we tack on to our Christianity. We can take it or leave it as we choose. No, it's, it's rooted in our relationship with Jesus Christ. God never intended for missions to be some specialized category that only a select few would ever do. We know how that's working out. We're falling behind. We're falling behind in getting the gospel to the world. God intended that being a missionary would be the distinctive mark of being a Christian. And it doesn't matter how uncomfortable that makes you feel. God has called us into His service. We've, I'm, I'm, there's been such a shift in, in, I've been saved a long time. I've been saved 54 years. I know, a gasp goes over the crowd. And uh, the, I, I've been, and by the way, been in church all my life. Well, not that I don't go home and other places, but I've <laughs> grew up in church. And I've, I've, I've observed a lot of things through the years. You know, I've seen a shift in things. As, and, and I understand. I'm not, I'm not minimizing this, but I, I'm saying I think we've, we've seen such an emphasis in, in the 60s and the 70s when there were a lot of thriving independent Baptist churches in America. The emphasis was on serving Jesus Christ. Uh, reporting for duty to the commanding officer, give me my orders, I'm ready to go. We were in the Lord's army. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. And boy, we got after it. That's why when John and Cheryl Polable got saved, uh, John, John enlisted in the bus ministry. Right? Well, you're supposed to do something. You got busy for God. You got busy serving God. When you got saved, you got busy. Because we're reporting for duty. You didn't... You didn't we, we've shifted now to where we thought like, well, maybe we emphasized the service so much we forgot to have the relationship with God, so now we all only talk about relationship. And guess what? Nobody wants to serve. How many of you men been in the service? Not the morning service, the evening service, or Wednesday night, so I'm in the <laughs> Army, Navy. Yeah. Tony, you were in the Army. Army. You got in the army, so you have a relationship with your sergeant, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Well, you didn't start out that way. And when you were a sergeant, somebody's somebody's laying on their bunk when they're supposed to be out doing something, and they said, "Hey, I love you, Sarge. Hey, I'm 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 your friend. I'm so glad you love me." Huh? Yeah. You'd have, you'd have put a boot somewhere. Would have motivated them. You understand what I'm saying? Do you understand the difference in, in the mindset? 
I'm here to do something for God. I'm here to report for duty. What are the orders you have for me? I want to serve you. I'm, I'm, I'm reporting for duty. Where it, It's not a matter of, can you imagine uh, if you're Brother Bob, a Marine, your sergeant comes to you and, you and he tells you what to do and you say, you know, I'm not real comfortable doing that. Hmm? I'm sure he's going to say, oh, well, I certainly don't want to make anything you do to be, can feel uncomfortable. No, you know what? You're in the, you're in the Army. You're in the Marines. You're in the, you're in the armed services. You do as you are commanded to do. You do as you're told. But somehow, we've lost that when it comes to God. How many times have we ever told God, and I'm saying we, well, I'm just not comfortable doing that. And we expect God to be understanding. Oh, well, okay, I don't want you to do anything uncomfortable doing. Hey, even parents, do you let your children get out of doing something because they say, I'm not comfortable doing that? You're going you're gonna to go apologize to your sister for saying that. Well, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that, Mom. <laughs> Whoa, okay. No, comfortable or not, you're doing it. You're comfortable or uncomfortable cleaning your room and making your bed, you're going to do that. Because that's what I've told you to do. And somehow we think, well, going and giving the gospel to somebody or witnessing to somebody or going... And, and by the way, as soon as we step out the doors of the church... You're on the mission field. Oh, I know. Yes, you can cross the ocean and you can be what a foreign missionary and go to another country, to another people. And, and, and God may be calling you to do that. And listen, you can't hide behind the, the excuse, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. If that's where God has told you to go, then you say, yes, sir, reporting for duty. Because He will enable you to do it. When you join the service, whatever you needed equipment-wise, uniform-wise, they provide for you. They'll give you what you need. They didn't say, hey, go out and buy your own uniform. Go out and get your own boots. Go, go find your own gun. They gave you all that. They're going to equip you with what you need to be a good soldier. God equips us for what we need to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And He'll equip us with the ability to give the gospel to others. We're called to serve. We're called to serve as witnesses every day of our life, on the job, in our schools, in our community, in our neighborhood. Yet so many believers are not willing to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Many believers won't even consider going on a missions trip. And again, why? It takes us out of our comfort zone. We don't want to be uncomfortable. Especially Americans are that way. Not willing to leave our place of comfort and safety. I don't think God... He said, pray ye therefore, Jesus said, the Lord of the harvest that will send forth laborers into His harvest. And we have missionaries come through and we have them call every week and we have them occasionally come through the church and you get to meet them and you get to see them and we have 71 missionaries that we support and you see them. Do you think they're the only ones that God is calling? Do you think God has stopped calling missionaries? Oh, God is still calling. Who's answering? Interesting study sometime if you just look in the Bible on, on who said, who said, here am I, Lord? Did you know Abraham said that? And he left Ur of the Chaldees. And he went out, he went out not knowing where he was going. I mean, if Sarah's like any normal wife, Abraham, where are we going? Uh, I don't know. Well, don't you think we should stop and ask for directions? <laughs> no, I, I know where we're headed. But Abraham said, here am I. 
Isaac said, Here am I. Jacob said, Here am I, Lord. Joseph said, Here am I, Lord. Moses said, Here am I, Lord. Samuel said, Here am I, Lord. Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. What I want to ask you this morning is, have you ever said that? Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. <laughs> have you ever said, Here am I, Lord. Hear my Lord. Send me. You ever said that? I don't remember the year, but it was several years after 9-11. The History Channel aired a program called The Man Who Predicted 9-11. It's a story of a man by the name of Rick Rescorla. Long before September 11th, Rick Rescorla, 62-year-old head of security at Morgan Stanley Bank, he developed an evacuation plan for the bank's offices which were high up in the south tower of the World Trade Center. Rescorla was convinced that Osama bin Laden would use jet planes to try and destroy the World Trade Center. The plan and its preparation was hugely unpopular with the Morgan Stanley staff, many of whom thought Rescorla was crazy. But on September 11, 2001, when American Airlines Flight 11 hit the World Trade Center Tower at 8.46 a.m., Rick Rescorla ignored building officials' advice to stay put and began the orderly evacuation of Morgan Stanley's 2,800 employees on 20 floors of the World Trade Center, Tower 2. The plane hit Tower 1. And 1,000 employees in the World Trade Center, number 5. Rescola reminded everyone to be proud to be an American and that everyone will be talking about you tomorrow. And he sang God Bless America and other songs over his bullhorn to help evacuees stay calm as they left the building. Rescorla had most of Morgan Stanley's 2,800 employees, as well as people working on other floors of World Trade Center 2, safely out of the buildings by the time United Airlines Flight 175 hit World Trade Center 2 at 9.07 a.m. After having reached safety, Rescorla returned to the building to rescue others still inside. He was last seen heading up the stairs of the 10th floor of the collapsing World Trade Center 2. His remains were never recovered. As a result of his actions, only six of Morgan Stanley's 2,800 employees were killed on September 11, 2001. And of those six, Four of them were Rick and three of his deputies who followed him back into the building to try to rescue others. I remember them saying they were surprised the death count wasn't much higher. There's one reason why. The remainder of that program was focused on Morgan Stanley Bank employees who now, in tears, were praising and acknowledging Rick Rescorla for saving their lives from total destruction on that day. Many felt so guilty and apologetic that they thought Rick was foolish enough to keep preaching and standing for what he believed would happen if they weren't ready. Those who were interviewed said they would never forget Rick Rescola. Can I say, as sinners saved by grace, we need to have a Rick Rescola kind of attitude. He was convinced that people entrusted to his care would perish if his plan of escape was ignored. And so he stayed the course even when it was unpopular, even when he was ridiculed, even when they made fun of him. He believed what he was doing would save their lives. He was consumed with saving others. 
And it's, it's us when we get consumed with saving others. How many times we, we fear, well, if I say something to them, they'll get angry. If I say something, they'll get mad. They'll be upset with me. Well, that's okay. Let them be upset. But listen, they'll be upset and one day they may sing your praise for saving their soul. I'm sure that wasn't comfortable for Rick Riscola. But our calling in Christ is not to keep doing what we've always done, but to trust Him and to be obedient to do what He's calling us to do now. We're called to go into all the world and to make disciples by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's calling you this morning to be stop being satisfied with what is and what you have done and answer the call to what He wants you to do. What does He want you to do? What can He do through you? God's called you to leave your comfort zone behind. Are you willing? Remember, I am a missionary and when you remember that and you remember the mission and you remember the message and you realize you are the messenger who have you told about Jesus in the last seven days since we last sat in this building and we looked at each other on Sunday morning how many people heard about Jesus this week because of you You are a missionary. There's people out there. Hey, I, I, we prayed in Sunday school for the two officers that were shot in cold blood yesterday over here in Westerville. Just answering a call. Domestic violence. Get to the door and somebody opens fire on him and kills him. My heart aches for their families. Both of them with wives, children. But I have to wonder, were they ready to go? Did anyone ever give them the gospel? Did they, did they ever receive eternal life through Jesus Christ? But they're not the only ones. And... and they weren't old. This past week, Emily's 26-year-old friend was gunned down in Steubenville. 26-year-old out in eternity. Was she ready? Had anyone ever told her about the gospel? Would you remember? Would you remind yourself? Would you ask God to help you remind yourself? I am a missionary now if God's calling you to not just be a missionary here but to take that message to some other people group somewhere else you better answer his call because while God certainly allows volunteers in the army he will draft you if necessary and your number will be called We'll soon, on Wednesday night, begin a study of Jonah. Jonah was unwilling to go, but he found out God can be pretty persuasive. Okay? God can be pretty persuasive. Why don't you say this morning, Hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, send me. I am a missionary. I have the mission, I have the message, and I'm the messenger. We all are. Heavenly Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for the attention of everyone today. Lord, thank you for the tremendous opportunity that's ours. Forgive us, Lord. 
for getting off mission. It is so easy for us, and you know this, to just get caught up in our world and what we want and what we like and what we think and our comfort and our ease and what we enjoy. Our happiness. And we let the world die and go to hell having never heard of Jesus Christ. Impress upon us today, Lord, that I am a missionary. I pray if Many times a day, you would bring that by your Holy Spirit back to our remembrance. I am a missionary. I am a missionary. May we always be ready to give the gospel to someone. I'm praying this morning, Lord, that you'll make each of us aware that we're to be missionaries for you. I'm praying this morning, God, that you will impress and that you will call some this morning from this congregation to go to another people group, to another country, to another place and tell someone about Jesus who've never heard. May there some today say, I know that means leaving what's comfortable for me. Getting out of my comfort zone. See God do something great through me and with my life. But speak to hearts in that way this morning.